In his commentary on Christ's Great Commission found at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew Henry asked, What is the principal intention of this commission? To disciple all nations. His answer? Do your utmost to make the nations Christian nations. Matthew Henry was right. Our task is nothing less than to make disciples not just of individuals, as if they were atoms floating around in space in a homogenous cloud, but nations. We are to disciple nations, even nations as nations. Without shame or embarrassment, every Christian should be able to answer the question, what is the aim of your church? With the answer, we want to make our city a Christian city, our state a Christian state, our nation a Christian nation, and our world a Christian world. We want our city, county, state, nation, and world to be saved and submit to Christ as King. This is our task. This is our aim. Reformer Ulrich Zwingli was a man who could give such an answer. He loved his city, the city of Zurich, so much that he was willing to die for it. For Zwingli, serving as the chaplain of the army, this love was no theoretical exercise. Here was a man who might in a moment need to put down his commentaries and pastoral duties, take up his arms, and go to battle with his men. October 11th, 1531 was such a day. It was early morning in Zurich, the kind of day that would have begun countless times before city square slowly awakening, merchants opening shop doors, windows opening in stone buildings around the city. But this day was different. This day, the city square was frantic with the movements of the people as they mustered to face an unexpected attack. Thousands of Roman Catholic soldiers had moved into Switzerland without warning several days before and were approaching the city. As the bells rang out their alarm and soldiers jangled through the streets, hurriedly collecting weapons and armor, mounting horses, and rushing to pull out the cannonry, a wooden door slammed open, revealing three small and tearful children. They quickly stumbled down the stone steps and ran to one of the soldiers, a red-haired man preparing to ride out on a horse to join the muster. Papa, don't go, the seven-year-old little Regula cried, her words choked with tears. Five- and three-year-old boys, William and Ulrich Jr., followed close behind to cling to their father's legs. The soldier, none other than reformer Ulrich Zwingli, pulled off his helm to embrace his children for what would be the last time. He looked up and saw his young wife, baby in arms, there at the door. As he gathered his family, Zwingli fought for words. The hour has come that separates us. Let it be. As he rode off, he knew that the battle was nearly hopeless. Outnumbered and outmatched, the men were ready to falter. Seeing this, the chaplain raised his voice and cried out, Men, this is our evil day. The battle which will shortly commence may be so heated that he who rests for a moment will be destroyed. Be sober, be vigilant. Your enemy will prowl about you, seeking to devour you. Listen to my words. Quit you like men. Be strong. Do you not hear in these words, brothers, our calling also as Christians? A Christian life is a battle so sharp and full of danger that effort can nowhere be relaxed without loss. We know not how God will decide the conflict on this sacred ground today. Many of us may not be standing in the flesh by nightfall, and yet we can stand in God's power. The Christian life is always a lasting victory, for he who fights wins if he remains loyal to Christ the head. My brothers, listen to St. Paul. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Heartened, the men rode forth, seeking to strengthen the few soldiers that were dug into defensive positions at the front. But their defensive positions, though situated on the high ground, had turned into a trap. Behind them, a marshy fen made retreat difficult. Before them, a forest provided cover for the Roman Catholic armies concealing their approach. As Zwingli and the men rode up, some urged caution and even retreat. It would be prudent, they said, to wait until more men could come up from the city before we strengthen the defense. Zwingli's response was given without hesitation. Dear sir, we cannot sit here while our fellows are dug into the fight. If the attack begins, will we watch the massacre? We must move into position. Perhaps we were fools to not make peace when we could. But our enemies will now settle for nothing but blood. They will attack. We must not shrink back now when our friends need us most. To talk in glowing terms of bravery when danger is far away is weak and despicable.
but to be steadfast and undeterred when confronted with danger, that is the only sign of a brave heart, end quote. War is hell. No amount of romantic retellings and big screen adaptations can do justice to the sharp metallic note of blood on the air. No studio sound design can capture what it's like to slowly bleed to death listening to the screams of dying men and horses. But in the end, Ulrich knew. As the sun set over the mud and gore of the Zurich battlefield, he lay, bleeding from spear wounds, head crushed in, feeling his life drain away into the rich earth of the Swiss field. The Roman Catholic soldiers found him there and offered him Catholic last rites. Zwingli simply remained silent, staring into heaven in prayer, until with his last breath he cried, they can kill the body, but not the soul. So died a man who gave it all in the hopes of a disciple, Switzerland. The King's Hall podcast exists to make self-ruled men who rule well and win the world. Well, welcome back to the King's Hall podcast. Uh, this episode is going to be a little bit different. Uh, you won't be hearing from my good friends Eric Kahn and Daniel Burkholder. Instead, we have a special guest with us, Stephen Wolf, uh, who has written a book on Christian nationalism and, and actually in defense of Christian nationalism, which is currently in editing with Canon Press. We think Stephen is a sharp thinker and a man that you should be listening to and hearing from, and, and we're delighted to be able to share this interview with you today. We think that no matter where you're coming from on these issues, that it will provoke you to deeper thought and consideration and also spur you on to love and good works. And so without further ado, let's roll the interview. Well, welcome back to the King's Hall podcast. I'm Brian Sauvey and joined here today with a special guest, Stephen Wolf. Stephen, how are you doing? Great, great. Thanks doing for having well. me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. We are glad to have, I was, I was talking with Mr. Wolf before we jumped in to the recording today about how we've been talking all about Christian political theory and, and a lot of things in recent episodes. And and we looked at one another recently, Eric, Dan, and I, and said, we should probably have somebody who knows things about this on the podcast to talk about it. We said, I wonder if uh, Stephen Wolf would jump on. And Stephen, you have a PhD in political theory? or what? Yeah. Uh, how would you describe that degree? It's, I mean, it's, some people might not like this, but it's basically political philosophy, uh, often very historically informed. Mm. So I, I think that's a, probably the best summary or the concise way to put it. That is, that, that sounds like actually an actually interesting thing to get a PhD in, <laughs> unlike many PhD topics that I've heard of through the years. And uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. You married, kids, uh, what do you do for a living, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm married uh, and have four kids. Uh, we recently moved to North Carolina from New Jersey. Uh, I just finished up the year, a year-long uh, fellowship at Princeton where I did, did some writing and partly finished the uh, Christian Nationalism book. Um, and so, and uh, right now I'm, I'm going to be teaching online for, for Liberty University, for King's College in New York City, and also teaching a class to high schoolers through Kepler. I think it's Kepler dot education. Oh yeah, yeah. The guy, um, uh, is it Daniel Focuson? And yeah, he's part of that. Yeah, Joffrey the Giant. Yeah, it's a great, it's yeah. a great kind of a uh, company where they allow independent teachers to kind of market their their courses. So oh, yeah, that's I'm excellent. About that yeah. Well, if I can find any links to that, I will also share share those links. We'll, All right. Th yeah, thanks. We'll definitely put up a bunch of links that, where you can find more about uh, Stephen and the work he's doing. You you do a podcast with Thomas Acord called Ars Politica. And yes. uh, what's what's that all about? We do kind of general topics in, in politics and, and, uh, and political theology. Uh, we usually don't do any kind of day-to-day -day stuff, uh, usually big ideas. Um, the intent is, as we say, to kind of reinvigorate the the Christian West. That that's kind of the mission is to talk about these. How, how do you do it? Um, and we we often analyze old ancient epics like the Iliad and Odyssey. And now we're working through the Aeneid. So it's a uh, it's a it's um it's it's I mean it's great working with Tom, Thomas Acord. If you guys know him, you should follow him mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, we've I I uh, recently listened to one of the episodes you guys did on the Aeneid because Eric is always making Aeneid references. 
And I, I'm like, I feel like I, I understand the the Aeneid, but I should probably. Eric seems to be outgunning, you know, Dan and I in Aeneid references per episode. So I <laughs> thought th- this was a go to. Yeah, that I know the the from looking through your episode backlog and the the titles, it just seems like that podcast is very much aligned with a lot of what we've been talking about in season one here at the King's Hall. So uh, I think our listeners would probably enjoy that podcast as well. And then you, you're also, you, you just mentioned it, you're publishing a book, writing a book with Canon Press on Christian nationalism. Yeah, it's a, What's it's a going defense on with that? Christian nationalism. So it's the, the manuscript is finished, at least uh, the, the first draft, I guess, and it's with the editors. I should get the edits back in a week. Uh, we don't really have a timeline for publishing, but I, I think within the next few months, it should be available. Mm, man, so, I'm really uh, ex- excited for that one. Yeah, I've, I've put a lot of work into it, and I, I've come to respect people who write books, even if I hate the book, because it takes a lot of work to, to put it down and, and say things right. So uh, I'm excited to see it come out. Yeah, we, we are definitely excited as well. I know uh, we plan on getting our hands on some copies of that and uh, reading it as soon as we can. Uh, definitely a book that needs to be written today, and uh, it actually really brings us to our main the main thing we wanted to discuss today with you, which really is Christian political theology, uh, especially in a historically rooted sort of way. I think one of the themes that our listeners have probably, if, if you take away nothing else from listening to season one of the King's Hall, and even if you disagree with some of our conclusions from our discussions, I think most people would get a sense that something has gone wrong in the last, I don't know, century or two in the Western world in the Western church, and that we've either been plundered or we've lost important treasures. We've given them away. We've had them taken from us. And uh, some of the answer to growing in maturity as a church going forward is is going to mean looking back over our shoulder and recovering or understanding the work of our Christian forebears. What, how did they think about politics? How did they think about uh, the theology? How did they think about masculinity, femininity, the family, culture, society? How do they think through these issues? And instead of making them up and maybe, you know, reading some Rick Warren and then coming to some conclusions, we should probably go farther back. So first question that I wanted to ask you really is is one that I think many of us have probably thought in our head. I wish someone would answer this question, but we feel like it will reveal that we're that we're dumb. For, for having to ask it. So so I think a good place to start would simply be to ask, what what do we mean by Christian nationalism? What do you mean by that? What What is it? That is a good question. And I think that it's actually a very smart question. Oh, and that's because people, well, because people throw around the word and they use it as, uh, they, I mean, basically they, they use the connotations of it. They try to engineer connotations around the, the term mm-hmm. and... Uh, and then they toss it out at someone and say, you're, you're a Christian nationalist. And because we have a sense that it's accusatory, we instantly want to deny it. And I think initially when I heard it, you know, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, mm-hmm. I guess my initial reaction was, no, I'm not. But then you start thinking about it. And I, I didn't use it of myself before then. I guess I had never thought of it. And I started thinking, but wait, that is what I believe. I am a Christian nationalist. <laughs> and so I think like people, it's funny watch on Twitter where, people who started accusing people of Christian nationalism, all of a sudden they're like, wait, they used to be bad. Now people are saying they are Christian nationalists. So I think it's a really good question uh, because you're you're basically, uh, you're confronting the people who are using it in a, the, the, the connotations they've engineered for it. So, but I mean, I, you're asking kind of for a definition. I'll just give my definition, uh, like a concise form. I, I have sure. a definite, like a longer definition in the book that I don't think will make much sense over podcasts, but I, I think it's just a Christian nation acting for its own good. I think that's the, it's very simple. It's just a people who are aware of themselves as Christian, as a Christian people saying, we're going to, we are going to act by act. I mean, through civil laws and through social custom, we are going to act for our good. And that good is both earthly and heavenly. And so uh, we can kind of parse what each of those means. And so that, that's my definition. And, but that's more of a, a kind of denoting what the words mean. It, it's kind of like a what some people have called a top-down sort of definition where you mm-hmm. kind of think of it conceptually. 
And that's my approach in the book is to think of it conceptually. But most of the time when people are talking about Christian nationalism as a, uh, the definition, they, they assume that it's bad, first of all. It's assumed from right. the outset that it's bad. Whereas my definition is more neutral in the sense that, yeah, I mean, a Christian people can act poorly. So there can be bad <laughs> right. forms of Christian nationalism. Uh, and of course, I want to assert the positive one, uh, and that it's it's possible and good and all that. But um, but if the the more neutral definition allows for it to be done well or poorly. So, whereas usually people assume it's bad, and then they but then they approach it from okay, let's let's think of cases and sort of the people out in the world. There's these goofy, weird charismatics. You know, they believe this. Some people think the Constitution is uh, equal to the Bible. Okay, we'll say that's Christian nationalism. Some people think that the Christian America is founded as a Christian nation. Okay, that's also Christian. So they they, they make this list like uh, like those guys with Samuel Perry and uh, what's, I forget the other the, the historian sociologist come up with this book. I forget what the name of it is right at this point. But they have a criteria of six different things. Then they have a, a kind of a spectrum of if you're Christian nationalism. Hmm. And it's it's these these things. Do you affirm this or that? And so it's trying to capture, it's almost like a sociological kind of modern political scientific way of approaching the question of what it is. And so when I say I'm a Christian nationalist, I don't necessarily affirm what you think, what, I don't necessarily affirm what some, you know, uh, like charismatic church people might believe. Right? And so I, I, so I think you need to be conscious that there's various ways to define these things. Uh, but again, my, my definition, just to go back to where we started, um, is, is just that it's a Christian people who are self-consciously acting for their own good, mm. both earthly and heavenly good. Or you could say you could say natural and spiritual good if you want to make that distinction. So that's that's kind of what I mean by it and uh, as yeah. a definition. So when you're and I that that's very helpful. And and actually that kind of opened up a door in my mind a little bit as I've mulled this over and thought, how would I define what does it mean to be a Christian nation? You know, because you get people who who will respond to any positive talk about a Christian nation with this kind of flippant nations can't be Christians or can't be Christian. Only people can be Christian. Have you heard that like flippant response? What do you think? What do you think about that? Well, this is something that like Jonathan Lehman has said and others, and they, they say that, that the only thing you can actually say is Christian are individuals and then, you know, religious assembly like churches. So Mm. you can have a Christian church and Christian individuals. Um, I mean that, I don't think they actually thought that through because then according to their own principle, you can't have Christian families. It's not clear you can have Christian schools. It's not clear you can have Christian, you know, clubs or so yeah. if, if you're restricting that designation as Christian to those to individuals and in, in churches, then you can't have a Christian family. But, but, but the thing is most people want to affirm that you have a Christian family, which means you have to kind of expand the principle. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what do you mean? I, I like to approach, Either you're kind of enmeshed in the Christian nation, or you're, or you've never experienced it, uh, and so it's harder to kind of identify it, I guess. But I think if you reflect on the family, I think that's a good way to kind of analogize into what the Christian nation is. So, a Christian family, you, you can be living right next door to non-Christian neighbors, and uh, they, they, man and man and woman married. It's a valid marriage. It's a legal marriage. It's a real marriage. Um, and it's it's according to the natural natural are the natural ways of the the, the, yeah. the uh, things of nature, right? So man and woman married, they have kids. We can recognize that that as a true family, true marriage. So fundamentally, they meet all that cri- all the criteria, mm-hmm. uh, except they're not Christian. Now, if if they were to become Christian, that does that would not extinguish or eliminate the fact that fundamentally it's a natural union, it's a natural family. So, but what what would they do? Well, they would add certain practices, and and they would correct errors that you know that grace and and scriptures revealed. But the fundamental thing that that entity is does not change. It's you could say it's perfected, like nature is, mm. is perfected with grace. Yeah. So I mean, so they'll add like they'll add family worship. They'll forgive each other in Christ. They will they'll pray together, and you know, and so and and if they're praying before, they'll pray. They'll still pray, but now they'll pray with knowledge and fellowship of God and, and, and in Christ. And so they, that family is now you can designate as Christian because it's yeah. added and kind of become this, you know, these practices. I think that's the same thing is with the nation that you still can have a, a nation that's according to the natural ties that bind a people, but, but it becoming Christian means that there's Christian aspects, there's Christian manners, there's Christian, um, there's, there's kind of a, 
hate to use the word, but there's sort of sort of cultural liturgies that incorporate Christian themes and Christian um, and scripture. Mm. There's a, a culture of, of worship. A, a, so just like the family attends worship, the nation kind of has this expectation of worship. And none of this means that you're, you know, redeeming nature or you're, you're redeeming the nation, the family in the same sense that an individual is, is redeemed. It's not as right. if you're, uh, that, that's how I, I mean, some people don't agree with this, but I tend to say that you're really just restoring the natural order of things, uh, whereas individuals are redeemed um, for heavenly life. Uh, but I think that you can think of nations and families as being coming Christian as a sort of rest, restoring what they ought to have been from the beginning, which is a worshiping mm. family, a worshiping people under God. So mm. uh, that I think so thinking of what, what a Christian family looks like and then using that as an analogy for what the nation, a Christian nation would look like, I think that's... Uh, uh, kind of a, a good way to kind of picture what a Christian nation would be. So what it's not, it's not saying you're not fusing. You're not saying that the nation is now a church that mm. as if there's like a, yeah. you're not saying that pre that the pastors are now the civil leaders. You're not conflating magistrate or magisterium and ministerium. Mm. Uh, you're, so you're keeping all those things uh, separate, but now the nation's kind of oriented to the worship of God. Oh, I'll well, say another thing. You're yeah. also not imminentizing the eschaton. In other words, you're mm-hmm. not you're not bringing heaven to earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're, you're not making the earthly life suddenly heavenly life. Mm-hmm. You're actually what you're doing is you're orienting earthly life to heavenly life. You know, so that means mm-hmm. there's an encourage people to to on their pilgrimage. That that is, it's not only yeah. ecclesiastical encouraging. It's not only your familiar your uh, the family doing. It, it's also the nation in general. Uh, encouraging those people to look to heaven. So instead of imminentizing yeah. the heavenly life, you're actually pointing and orienting uh, earthly life to that. And I think that's just yeah. crucial distinction. That that actually, I mean, I yeah. hope all those explanations. I hope eliminate the uh, at least some of the, the the criticism that one might that, that I've heard. Yeah, no, that that's very helpful. I think we we often think in terms of ditches on either side of the road. You know, you're going down the road of truth. And you can err in equal and opposite directions often. And it seems like both of the errors that you just pointed at live in the wild in big ways today, where you have, you know, on on the one side of the road, folks who they don't want to uh, heavenize earth at all. They they don't want to see the economy or the ways of heaven. They kind of want to see life in the natural order, in the natural world, sort of sealed off hermetically from heaven and the economy and they don't want to pray in the same way that I'm praying your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven I mean things when I pray that or I'm asking of God things like please um, make families in my church and make rulers in Weber County Utah and rulers in Utah and rulers in America and rulers in the world um, please see them either on the one hand become Christian converts truly bend the knee to Christ and begin to do their duties with reference to the way God made the world in its natural state and intended for it to work and to obey Christ in their duties. Uh, so I think there's an error on that side of the road. Um, and and I would, and I, I'm going to ask you about this in a minute, but I, I think I would locate that in some of the expressions of people who describe themselves as two kingdoms today two kingdoms theologians end up sometimes, well, just kind of hand-waving the Noahic covenant and everything and saying <laughs> the, the, the scriptures and Christian morality has nothing to do with LGBT issues. and it, it, But on the other side of the road, there really are people who just collapse and conflate the two and overly immunitize the eschaton and, <laughs> and just say, yeah, heaven on earth, this isn't a pilgrimage in any meaningful sense. Is is that a, is that what you're saying? Am I understanding you correctly? And do you did that? Did those words make sense? No. Yeah. Yeah. I think on on one end, it's interesting how sometimes they can actually converge in their own in, in yeah. belief. Sometimes Michael Horton sounds like uh, neo Calvinist. Sometimes he doesn't. It's it's weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the more the liberal neo Calvinist. Um, but yeah, I think on on one side, yeah, you have uh, historically people would point to like someone like Roger Williams, and he he certainly wanted like you said seal off the secular from the sacred. And then on the other side, you have the people who think everything's sacred. 
Like mm-hmm. every aspect of life is is sacred or holy, and there's that that they think that the secular sacred distinction is a false distinction. Both of those are are rather are rather, are rather uh, new um, developments. Uh, the 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 secular sacred distinction is you know ancient in the church, mm-hmm. and uh, I think it'd be I think it it messes with your theology and all sorts of things if you if you deny it. But yeah, I think that the way I the way I see it is nature itself calls for you to worship God rightly. And to um, trust and obey God, and I think mm-hmm. that the the principles of nature dictate to civil leaders that they ought to promote true religion. That's the principle, you know. You ought to promote true religion. Well, well, what's true religion? Well, Christianity is true religion, so yeah. you ought to promote Christianity. So there's that syllogism there, and I real I say this in my book. It's kind of the like the most important syllogism in the book. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. again, what's the, the natural principle is you magistrate, you're a minister of God. You want to serve and promote and and secure and all that and protect true religion. God has revealed that no Christianity is the true religion. Uh, mm-hmm. So you've kind of we've kind of gone from natural religion to, to uh, revealed religion, and that so Christianity ought to be, um, you know, like I said, protected and supported. For the project of this season to be successful, the project of seeing a new Christendom built. There will need to be thousands and thousands of Christian men and women who are equipped to stand for the truth of Scripture against the errors of both the liberal church and the pagan culture. This is one reason we're so glad to be partnering with our sponsor for this season, Reformation Heritage Books. Reformation Heritage Books offers a large selection of helpful and theologically rigorous resources on everything from biblical theology to history to blue-collar family discipleship the type of library and resources that could make the kind of men and women I just described, grounded in the rich heritage of the Reformed faith. We'd like to highlight one resource in particular, their Family Worship Bible Guide, that presents rich devotional thoughts on all 1,189 chapters of the Bible, including searching questions to promote conversation and to help you in leading your family in such a way as to say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Tap the link in the description of this episode to pick one up today. That that's where those two things are reconciled, and I think people, some people who want to, uh, they want to assert something like, "Well, natural law doesn't contain grace." So, natural law, yes, humans ought to follow natural law for their happiness and their good, but but natural nature is different than grace, and so nature does not is should not should not support or point to oriented to things of grace or another word to put it is that the he- the he- earthly should not be oriented and pointed to and support what's heavenly and i think that's false and so i think what's fundamentally heavenly and natural is actually that uh the the end and the telos of all that mm-hmm. is actually the higher things and higher life uh so uh, so i think that's where you hold those two you know if you want to call it the dualism as neil calvinists like to say that's how you reconcile those two things. So you don't have to be a Roger Williams who, who separates sacred from secular, and you don't have to deny that there's a distinction at all. You just affirm that one's lower and, and ought to serve the higher. Mm. That's how I understand it. So, I mean, again, yeah, so it's yeah. like the church itself uh, as an institute is a, is a higher institution than the state in a sense because it serves the highest good. That doesn't mean it dictates anything to the lower in terms of the civil. I mean, we get to that as well. But the magistrate ought to serve the good of his people, and why mm-hmm. not? And, and how could you not orient them and provide for them the highest good, which is offered in the church? And so the magistrate mm-hmm. ought to encourage and legislate to the extent of his power that people would procure that that good. Yeah. So I think in that sense, secular and secular are separate but not utterly distinguished or not yeah. utterly separated, but they are separated institutionally. You affirm sacred secular distinction. And mm-hmm. at the same time, they're reconciled. You don't, you don't collapse either one. So, and yeah, I think and that's a traditional view. I think that's mm-hmm. like the, that's the classical Protestant position. Yeah. Are there any examples that come to mind for you from that, from Protestant history of places and people and rulers and where church was working properly with state where you didn't have like you, you've you've wrote the other day one fundamental principle of sound Christian politics is that the instituted church is not the center hub assembly embassy origin prime example or source of Christian politics which sounds very much like a sphere sovereignty sort of yeah. 
that, statement. There's a lot. There's a lot going on there in my tweet. Uh, you don't, yeah, that's uh, a dense. That, that, that require an essay, uh, and, and I talk yeah. about that in the book as well. Mm-hmm. I understand that, that people give. Yeah, they think I'm I'm like channeling Scott Clark or something with that, uh, or some <laughs> other R two K guy. Yeah, just to explain myself on that. Sure. It, it said that I see that the church and state as two separate institutions, um, mm-hmm. each having its primary role. And the primary role of the church is to um, to administer the things of heavenly life, or, or uh, um, to minister to a sacred assembly. So it'd be as the people in their spiritual relation for the things that that orient and or that that you know, if you essentially fix your eyes on on Christ in heaven, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. And that's the role of it, and, uh, and that complements the role of the state, which is to support outward outward good, um, mm-hmm. and uh, directly, and of course, I think indirectly support the work of the church. And, and Christian higher things. So yeah. the in that sense the and, and also the the state and also the 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 states or the I say pol- the you know civil politics principles come from from nature or the nature of things uh us as man I've, as I've already talked about. And so the source of it is really just the it's not it's it's not as if the church is or the pastors are like sort of channeling divine precepts for the state must follow. It's it's more that the politics is a matter of deliberation over what is good given the circumstances, and neither the pastor nor even the institute church itself is is equipped to do that. That's the responsibility of politics. Now, I think pastors have a a teaching authority and role within that, but it's it's the ultimately the magistrates or the civil rulers' decision on what is what is good given the circumstances according to the principles that actually originate in nature itself, not from the institution, the, the church institution. Oh, so, okay. I, th- I mean, there's a lot yeah. we can talk about there, but I mean, I sure. hope that yeah. kind of summarizes what I meant. Yeah, l- let me try yeah. to summarize what I think y- I'm hearing, and you can tell <laughs> yeah. me if I'm, if I'm understanding you. Okay, good, yeah. And, yeah. and, and because I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, I think first it's important that listeners would understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you're talking about, the church as institution, yeah. because a lot of times people hear church and they immediately they colla- they they collapse it into all of the individual Christians that make up the church, right. and so they think, of course, the church is over politics because we want politicians to be members of the church who are under right. the authority of elders, and you can end up with this sort of collapsed world where it's an ecclesiocracy, and the pastors become sort of because of their role as elders and pastors in a church over even Christian politicians, they become in this kind of arch authority position. And it's easy to kind of categorically collapse all of those things together. Because we're talking about, I mean, ideally, we're talking about Christians being Christians as they go about their role as magistrates. But that doesn't mean those two things are the same institution. So you're talking instant right. on an institutional level, yeah. So I mean, yeah, in, yeah, institutional level. Mm-hmm. So you have the pastors, and you have the 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 things of that mm-hmm. uh, of, of that entity or kingdom, and th- those, yeah. So those things are separate, and and people can be Christians. You can be a Christian magistrate. Uh, apart from, in in a sense, apart from the Institute of Church. Not that you're, you, you ought to be, of course, members of, right. uh, a member in the Institute of Church, but you're, but the magistrate is not under pastors as magistrate. He's under right. God. Right. And so I think that's a crucial distinction. So you're, and you yeah. can't treat, the ministers are, in a sense, heralds of, of Christ, uh, primarily for the, the, for heavenly life, sacred things. They also have a teaching authority about secular things from the Bible and matters, but magistrates, it, I see them not like think of a military authority. So in, in militaries nowadays in the U S the U S military, in anything that's at Lieutenant Colonel, like Oh five or etern, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel general and above, you'll have an assigned chaplain to that unit, but the chaplain is not in the chain of command that mm. the, the, if you're commander of a battalion, you don't have to, you don't have to get permission from the chaplain to go and do this or that. Mm-hmm. But the chaplain, it does have an advisory kind of moral spiritual role within the yep. unit for the commander, also for the soldiers as well. 
but he does, he's not in the chain of command. And I think that, so when terms comes a civil authority, civil power, uh, enacting civil law, the, the ministers have this sort of advisory kind of um, like special staff, as we call the military role, mm-hmm. but, uh, but they can't kind of have a veto or negative on the, ma- the magistrate uh, on the civil rulers action. Mm. So I, I think that's, yeah. that's one way to think. So there is a supplemental, there is an advisory role because right. you're handling the things of God. And, and, and I mean, for two things, two things. So in scripture, you have things, you can think of th- things of grace. So the, the, the magistrate ought to know what, well, you're supposed to support true religion. Well, what is true religion? And so the, the, mad, the minister ought to teach in that sense. And then there's, of course, the in scripture, there's the, you can say, republished or the inscripturated natural law or the, the you know, human duties. And so uh, even though everyone can open and read the Ten Commandments, pastors and the- theologians are generally expected to exposit those. So what we, so what are the full scope of the Sixth Commandment? You know, because that, that's not just you know, you shall, shall not murder. It's actually things like support life. And there's all sorts right. of things you can get, gain from that. And pastors have done this and theologians of this forever. So yeah. that, that then again, it's not, it's not a pastor saying you must enact these laws. Boom. Here you go. Here you go. Mm-hmm. It's not as if the, yeah, uh, I don't want to beat that too much, but, but, but they do expose. So they have that supplemental role as well. And, uh, mm-hmm. and magistrates, if they were wise would, would listen. Um, but they don't have to blindly follow ministers in their, in their enactment. Yeah. So the, and, and the way we've talked about this in previous episodes is we've like sort of unpacked some theses on um, political theology really does. I, I think we're in a lot of alignment there where you're, you're, you're thinking of God obviously as the arch director, he's the source of authority in every sphere. He's the source of authority in every institution, every government. He says, here are the limits and the boundaries of your authority. Like, okay, Wives submit to your husband, but that doesn't mean all wives submit to any husband. Right? That he's, he has limitations on his authority. He has directives from God. Fathers, raise your children up in the Paideia and Uthesia of the Lord. So, so he has these duties. Fathers provide. A man who doesn't provide for his household is denied the faith. He's worse than an unbeliever. So he has a world that he lives in, and, and he has real authority there that other people don't have that's unique to him as, as a father in his station. And then he is still that sphere of authority, that world is embedded in other worlds. He's in the church. He's in a nation. So he's under authority in a certain way in the church. But those that ecclesial authority is also receiving its marching orders from God. Here are the limits to your duties. Here's what God says you are to do. Preach the word in season and out of season. Keys of the kingdom, you know, uh, church discipline, administration of the sacraments, the things as what you're saying, things of heaven. These are the, the 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 duties that have been given to that sphere, that world, that institution, and then city fathers, national fathers, civil leaders, also have duties that have been given to them by God, and they have authority in that realm that the pastor doesn't have, the father doesn't have in the same way, and they all interlap and create. I think some of the difficulty is that many of us want to, to come up with or we want to always be able to describe in, in this super clean way where they're all just completely isolated sort of spheres and where it gets messy and where it gets difficult is that these all, our lives are continually living in all of these different worlds at the same time. And they're all clashing with one another sometimes and we have different you know, leaders pulling in different directions. And so I think, you know, some of the time you end up with errors that are the result of this, just the reality that it's not, it is not as clean as we often want it to be in the wild. And you, th- you think about like a Christian living in America today, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of room for conflict as these different institutions pull in different directions. And sin kind of exacerbates that. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that, I mean, I think that civil government is, is, an, is a natural institution. Of course, yeah. family is. I think uh, worship is natural, of course. And and I, I, I don't know if the, the ecclesia office is natural. I, I go back and forth on whether or not that, that's instituted mm-hmm. or, or natural. But but yeah, I mean, th- there's these overlapping, like the you know, so-called spheres of life. 
but they kind of overlap. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. we, uh, an abusive father, we want someone to take care of that. So we've, we've yeah. said the state will take care of it or an abusive husband. We you had the state take care of that. And in the past it was brothers or, you know, the, the, um, the, the father of the, of the woman who was being abused or whatever, but we, we thought it would be more, more fitting for the state to do that. So, yeah, I mean, there, there's all sorts of these conflicts and this, this is, I think this just is going to be, it's just inevitable. Yeah. Because you have, I mean, also you, you have a political leader who has a certain vision and, and it might be a good vision, but it's hard to communicate to each person. Uh, because sometimes just like, just like everything, there's, uh, what is it? Thomas Sowell likes to say, I think there are no solutions. There's only trade-offs. Mm. And so sometimes in the grand vision, there's, there's people who are going, seemingly going to lose, um, be on the negative end of the trade-off. So, or they might be in the positive end, but, but these, but the fathers or the individuals can't see that they actually would be, you know, they think to their perception or then their, it would be bad for them. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, just w- with sin and then, uh, and, and distrust, and it's going to be, um, kind of age old, it's going to continue on. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. I mean, you've identified a, a, a clear problem that just requires the best leaders you can have. Yeah. Um, and I, again, I think, I think that the church instituted church and pastors have a good role in this, not, not necessarily mm-hmm. as like the middleman between everything, but just to, just to, to teach one deference to the authority, the, uh, to, to encourage mutual trust between the different, different parts from the civil magistrate to the mm-hmm. fathers to individuals. And so, yeah, I yeah. do, I do think there's a, there's kind of a teaching function, uh, at, as part of a sanctification in the church. For that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to read another quote that I think is from you. I, it might be that I'm remembering this wrongly as I pulled it off of your Twitter. But okay. so correct me if this actually was someone else <laughs> it, from your Twitter. It says the civil ruler as tyrant is akin to a foreign invader. And just as a people can violently repel a foreign invader, so too. And in the same way, can they repel or depose a tyrant? Was that was that you or were you quoting? Yeah, someone? that was me. Yeah. That OK. Me. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, that's an argument hard, in the book, too. <laughs> a hard <laughs> turn here. Well. But this is now in the category of what do you what do you do when sin gets into the system in a in a serious you know beyond we disagree about a particular civil penalty within a particular subset of infraction we're talking about a civil ruler who is now lording it over his people you know in many many such cases so uh, w- maybe unpack that concept a little bit for us how how do we deal with tyrannical leadership. If there are any examples from history that come to mind, I think that would help as well for uh, just kind of conceptualizing this in in particular examples, maybe. Yeah, I mean, this gets into what, what's uh, um, whether or not people the people can depose their rulers. And this yeah. uh, we don't talk about that so much anymore just because it doesn't seem like it's going to happen anytime soon. But I think it's important yeah. for us to think about these things. In, in the U.S., I think another example, uh, like an analogy here could be helpful. I just use the word helpful and someone's going to, uh, anyway. <laughs> I usually, I criticize people for using that word. Anyway, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I know someone now on Twitter is going to be like, Wolf used tw- uh, helpful. You said helpful. Um, no, so, so the, the uh, military officers, they're commissioned by the state to, um, in, in the, mili- the U.S. military at least, they are commissioned by the state to give only ethical and moral and lawful orders. Okay. okay. That, so that's the scope of their authority as military officers. If, if uh, a military officer were to then order murder, order their soldiers, his soldiers to conduct murder, as in that is do something unjust, he is no longer acting within his his authority as military officer. And indeed, he doesn't even have the authority, the power, doesn't have the power and authority to say that. And if he, and so in that sense, that military officer is not ordering as a military officer, he's ordering just as an any old, a man. And even though, so if you're a soldier, you can resist that command, not simply because it's unjust, uh, but because he doesn't actually have the authority to command that. Mm, right. And so in that sense, his order is not coming from him as an officer, but as a man. And you can resist men who order you to do false things. In fact, unless you're under some sort of authority relationship, you don't have to do anything that another guy tells you to do. And so in that case, well, using that as, an, I guess, an example or an analogy of what civil ruler is like, if a civil ruler commands you to do something unjust, you should not generally, well, we can kind of get distinguished here a little bit, but 
you're not obligated to to obey that command because he's not ordering you as a civil ruler, but as a, just a man. Okay, and th- that isn't that you could say that's a it's a tyrannical every 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 unjust command by a civil ruler is a tyrannical act, but that doesn't mean he's a tyrant. Mm-hmm. Just like we can say that someone who does some has some error doesn't mean that he has a pattern of that error or that uh, right. of, of that sin. Um, I think Pastor, Pastor Doug Wilson says something said something like, "Biblically, it's possible for a ruler to get a C minus. It's not just an yeah. A or an F. Like sometimes right. it says, and he did this, but he did not tear down the high places. Like he did, he did pretty good over here. Yeah. He wasn't as bad as you know this other guy. So." Uh, yeah, th- I mean, it, there's there are yeah. gradations here, right? Yeah, so that's a good way. To, but when someone is as a tyrant, I, I I define that a tyrant is someone who who strikes at the fundamental goods of society, which I think also mm. includes religion. So I think you can have someone who actively uh, is trying to suppress true religion is a tyrant. Yeah, um, and other things, of course, other things as well. But so I think in that case they can, they, and so I said as a uh, an invader. So if you think about the like an invading army it's someone who is not under your authority they are aggressing against you trying to do you harm and so we we usually you know according to the classical view of just war we can actually militarily resist those people try to in a certain sense crush them so i think a tyrant that uh, is is akin to that is basically the same thing he he's a man even though he has the formal title of your king or your president or whatever right he is acting in such a way that makes him a tyrant. And so he's just a man acting, essentially attacking you. Yeah. So it's basically the same thing. I mean, you can think of it as a domestic enemy who's risen up to try to harm you. It's the same thing. He just yeah. has a lot more people and he has the appearance of real authority when he doesn't actually have that authority. And so you can resist it. So I think that's, it's, I think it's a, it's a proof, I think for, you know, if you, if you, if you if you accept the premises, I think yeah. you, you'd have to conclude that yes, people can violently resist that person who is aggressively seeking to do you harm, mm. and I, and that's that's a justification not only for deposing but also to depose using violent means. Yeah, and and I say that in principle, so I don't want people to misunderstand. That. Of course, it's a very serious thing to go right um, conduct revolutions. Oftentimes, things either get worse or they're unsuccessful, and so it's something you have to. You don't just kind of flippantly throw out, but at the times the situation calls for it yeah, and it ought to be done. Uh, but so in principle, I think it's justified in practice. It's something you have to really have, you know, a great deal of care when you go about doing it, of course. And, and I mean, similar to the classical principles of just war, one of the variables in that assessment has to be feasibility of success, like or, or right. probability of success. One guy, you know, somewhere in some American you know, city during the COVID insanity saying they're giving me tyrannical laws. So I'm going to go out, you know, me and my cousin, and we're going to take on the the Seattle government, right? It's like, even if you could derive from the principle, maybe some sort of just, some scenario to justify, well, in theory, we could resist this because it's an unlawful, you know, it's beyond, this, they're just functioning as men now. They're not really... A, you know, giving just decrees within the scope of their authority. Would you would you agree with that? There's there's still going to be some sort of part of that equation is going to be well. Could, do we have any hope of you know, success and not just our entire family being destroyed <laughs> and all dying? Yeah, I mean, you know, some feasibility, and, and this goes back. Yeah, so feasibility, and and I think related to that is the well known lesser magistrate doctrine. Right. And I, I discuss that in the book as well. Um, okay. And I, I think it's more. I think it's be- better to think of it as a, as a like an authority principle. I, I think you. I think that people at the local level could actively resist if mm-hmm. the threat is immediate to their community. Mm-hmm. Just like if someone comes into your house and seeks to do you or your family harm, you right. can violently resist that person as well. So I think a community could, like a, a town or something, kind of, you know, like we saw. Lexington, Concord, something like yeah. that, where you can you can resist like that. But eventually, you need that Continental Congress. You need that yeah. authority. Yeah, and I think you need that for practical reasons. That because you need organization to conduct yeah. it, to make it feasible. You need organization, and then you need something to be some entity to have. If you're successful in deposing, actually 
help yeah. you re, uh, reinstate something. So what, what's I think that replace it. Yeah. So I, I, I think the lesser magistrate doctrine is, is just, I think of it very practically. Yeah. I, I don't think of it in terms, I mean, there is a principle there, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary to begin. You know, I doesn't have to have a magistrate in, in, in charge. Um, okay. To, so that, that's for the inter- origins. Yeah. Yeah. That was a question yeah, I, that we've discussed. Do you need yeah, a magistrate yeah, yeah. for it to be lawful and legitimate? Or are yeah. there situations where no lesser magistrate, they're all in they're all all the way up and down the chain of command, they're like yes to tyrant tyrannical decision X. You know, well, what do I mean, you do? You, yeah, you don't want it to of course I mean just practically you don't want a mob. Uh, yeah. and but yeah, I, I think you can institute your own authority uh, over yourself. So it doesn't have to yeah. be a pre existing I mean it's probably more ideal to have it like that. <laughs> yeah. Because then you have a authority structure already um, designed mm-hmm. uh, that can just be kind of ob- um, to uh, com- modified or, or um, augmented. But, but yeah, I mean, I think you have to, you're practically going to need some kind of authority um, right. for, to, for feasibility. So yeah, yeah. someone's got to deploy troops. Someone's got to say, this is how we're going to manage this group. These are our yeah. directives. This is what we are and are not aiming to do in terms of our re- objective. It just practically, those things are those are just obvious. You, you just can't, you cannot succeed without those in place. Are there any, you know, practically speaking, I, I mean, for, for the vast majority of us and the vast majority of situations that we're actually in today, we're not near to repelling our rulers with violence as a foreign invader, right? Most of us are probably not. In any situation close to that where we're, you know, thinking, yeah, this senator, he's got to go. <laughs> right. No, I can't think of a, a, a situation where that's going to happen. But it does seem like this principle could lead Christians today to make decisions and to order their lives around this principle and take action locally and how they're, you know, maybe thinking about, for example, political engagement in their local world. Because it seems to me like having a sheriff, our sheriff here in Weber County is Sheriff Arbon, and many Christians, you know, many folks in our church, we're in communication with him through a lot of the COVID-related stuff. Just like, hey, Sheriff, this guy has said this in the governor's office, but we don't intend to follow it because he's telling us we can't gather and worship. So, you know, we've done the work. Here's a 10-minute explanation of why we, we, we do not intend to submit to this decree. Where are you at? What will you do? <laughs> if, if they say, hey, go, yeah, go shut, go put a chain on this door, what would you do? And, and thankfully, I mean, he's not a Christian, but he said, he kind of laughed. He's like, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. None of our guys are going to do that. We're, you know, and, and so I, I don't think that they got an A when you look at all of the, there were things that were dumb and enforced, but they didn't get an F. And then we started thinking, well, what would happen if, and this is all leaven work, this is all long, long haul work, what would happen if the men of our church decided to start showing up at our city council meetings and respectfully engaging, just being present, not just showing up when it was stuff that was like, we're mad about this, but just showing up, being, in, being politically involved. We have some gentlemen working in the business world, to kind of gain, they, they understand that one homeowner doesn't have the same sway in city politics as a business owner who owns an influential business in the city. So we have guys thinking through this, and to me that, that kind of thinking is really classed under this category of, you know, if you're ever going to have a situation where lesser magistrate things are going to happen, work probably had to start 10 or 50 years before that in at least having some hope of some people salted through the local civil world that if not our, if they're not Christians, at least our friends of Christians have been befriended and understood and loved by Christians and say, well, these are, these are actually people I, I care about and I want to see the civil magistrate order political life for their their natural good. I'm rambling, but I, it, this is a I think 
this is a door that is fr- that can be very fruitful in terms of application in a topic where there's a lot of theory. It can tend to be like, well, what would it be like to have a Christian name? What would all these things be like? Where most of us are not, you know, in a situation that is close to anything like Christian nationalism uh, in our actual world. But I think it is practical if you start to look at, well, if we have a proper aim, we can actually start to, to aim for it. You know, we can actually... So, so I guess the question yeah. f- for you would just be uh, taking some of these principles and doctrines, how should they affect the life of Christian churches, normal Christian families today? Are there things that we should be doing differently and ordering our lives differently and churches differently in light of, you know, maybe we could say the goodness of Christian nationalism? Yeah, I mean, it's a great, great question. Um, I, I think that people will criticize my book because I don't actually get into the practical side as much mm-hmm. as they might um, might want. I, I think what you said about contacting the, the sheriffs, knowing the sheriffs well, uh, county representatives, city and town, and the and the state. I, th- I think the the local level is going to be very important as as sort of lesser magistrates that can resist the kind of encroachments of the federal government. Uh, I think there's also, I mean, it depends on what state you're in, but uh, some states are not any good uh, either. States kind of have more like more formal power in a sense to order mm-hmm. cities and towns and than the federal government at least. I mean, the federal government still exceeds its uh, authority all the time, but. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I think that, yeah, I think encouraging that local action, like you said, uh, is, is really important. I think also just Christians being in office and and knowing that that they, I think that the important thing about the, the U.S. system is that state governors, they receive their authority from God directly. So in our federal system, it's not as if that, it's not as if the the, the federal power is somehow kind of like that that civil power is kind of like uh funneled through or is is um is devolved upon from federal to the state mm-hmm. no it's an arrangement of federal government in the states and so the state governments do not re- the state governors do not receive their power from the federal government you don't have the president right. at every state at every state governor in- inauguration you don't have that where the president is now you know doing some sort of ceremonial act to say now you're the governor Hominus so, dominus. Here's the federal authority for your yeah, for your office. Yeah, right. So right. So that means that the state governor, and I wish they had known this for 60, 70 years. Yeah. State governors have the authority and actually the obligation to to be ministers of God, and of course they have to do what they can. Uh, I mean, sometimes you can't. Uh, if, if you really, if the governor is Presbyterian, you may not be able to get that uh, turn Georgia into Presbyterian state establishment. Um, Georgia, yeah, you might not establishmentarianism. Right, so you have to do, for you know, it. Politics, do is, it. politics is politics. The yeah, politics of the possible, you know. Uh, but yeah, that, that's really important. And I, I think the 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 idea of just resistance itself, it can be, of course, there's idea of deposing, there's idea of violent revolution. But or, ordinarily, and I think in our case especially, the importance is just having that lister magistrate as a as someone who's going to assert and uh, assume and assume their their station as someone who has their authority from God in in a sense through the people. Yeah, and for the people, uh, and also just assert that that duty uh, and yeah, and enact what's good. So the federal government's going to force upon us some uh, legalized abortion. The state governor should say no. And if a federal uh, federal authorities show up to the state to try to enforce mm-hmm. it, you arrest them and kick them out. Yeah, I mean things like that's that. Right. So, uh, and that's not being lawless. It's actually being lawful because it's lawless to go have abortion right. in the first place. No, it's unjust. Right. And so a state governor who's powers from God is, is allowing abortion in the state. I mean, that's, um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, unjust and he's disobeying God. It doesn't necessarily mean he's mm-hmm. a tyrant, I guess. Well, I mean, it's debatable, I guess, but, uh, but, yeah. but he is definitely disobeying God not to obey in that regard. Um, yeah. So I, I yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of rambling on too, but it's, it, it's just the importance of having that, assuming your authority and then asserting, um, what's right. Yes. We live in this, best I can say, modern liberalism under this very technocratic capitalist, whatever you want to say it. I mean, it's we're just so we're so well connected that imposing yeah. a certain vision upon all of us is not a matter of of law all the time. It is kind of a matter of law, but it's also this very strong social pressure mm. that's almost invisible. The, the The acceptance of of homosexual marriage over the last five years, how that's increased. Well, it's 
people yeah. say, oh, the, the law has a teaching pedagogical function, which is true. But mm-hmm. it's also the fact that it's we're drowning in rainbow flags all over the place. It's a, right. You know, so it's people and, and the moment in the moment you would question that people just uh, attack you. Same thing with yeah. the trans thing, which is just a few <clears throat> years old and the and, and around that. And so, yeah. We're, so my point is that it's it's harder to see how revolution can even be because it's so incremental and it's so yeah. uh, subtle. It's not subtle, but it, but the way that it influences you is more subtle. The way the way that people twenty years ago would say, like I'm just thinking people I knew back in a couple of decades ago, they, they they didn't want you know anything done to homosexuals. They they want to just live mm-hmm. in peace and toleration. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea of gay marriage that's crazy. Uh, that's yeah. just ridiculous. But now they're waving the rainbow flag or they're very, they're, um, or at least they're right. kind of general supporters don't want to rock the boat sort of people. So, right. Right. Um, it's just that the very subtle way that these ideas get ingrained and accepted socially. Christendom Bible college offers a one year certificate in the humanities for students who intend to pursue a degree or for students who prefer to begin their chosen occupations upon completion of our program. Older students who never attended college or who went to a college where the humanities were less robust will also find our program stimulating and suitable. Located steps from the Ohio River in the town of New Richmond, we're unaccredited in order to remain free to teach as our biblically minded consciences demand. As servants of Christ, we won't wear the yoke of the woke. Instead, we stand on the shoulders of Christianity's giants, not to stew in nostalgia, but to see through the culture wars fall to the glorious days of a Christendom still to be built. Our exceptional faculty are committed to the historic biblical foundations of our faith. Come be a part of Christendom Bible College. Visit us on the web at christendombiblecollege.org to learn more. While there, be sure to sign up for our email updates and receive your free three chapter excerpt of our very own Dr. Frank J. Smith's new book, Race, Church, and Society. Yeah, I mean, the law has a pedagogical function, but the law is also a reflection of the pedagogical uh, influence of other institutions and other factors, where the law is ultimately going to, in a, a civil way, just put on stone and say, this is what we as a people think is the good. This is what we think is beautiful. This is what we think is uh, proper for an, a, a well-ordered... T- we think this is natural. We think it's natural for two men to be in a marriage union, be able to adopt children. We think that's good. And so we'll put that in the law. And so, you know, obviously you can't think of any of these institutions as living, as, as pulling all the weight all the time. They're always going to be pulling some of the weight, educational institutions and and, and entertainment. I mean, there's just so many factors that go into the discipleship of a people to believe something as crazy as what we've, you know, said we now believe about gay marriage and transgenderism, but, et cetera. But you know what? I mean, I think we can learn something from what we're experiencing because we, it's easy. Well, it's, um, I guess it's easy to affirm that gay marriage is wrong as a pure intellectual matter. Mm-hmm. But then it's all, it's harder to like socially there. It feels like uh, it, it's interesting how people, when people deconvert so-called deconversion, mm-hmm. it's always somehow it, they just LGBTQ that that's the first thing they apologize for. It's almost as if it's yeah. like a, a release tension in their mind. Yeah. It's as if they have, it's like this release from battling something. And I think that's partly the case as Christians, yeah. we can be committed to orthodoxy, moral orthodoxy, but then also have this lingering, like irrational urge to reject it. Mm-hmm. And that's so that's the social forces around us. But I don't think that's in itself wrong. That is that 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 kind of social force. Now, I'm not saying mm-hmm. the LGBT social force, I'm saying just as a general force, power. Yeah. It's actually good. And that's why I think Christian nationalism will will happen only if the people themselves want to kind of socially force it. It's not just a matter of law. Yeah. It's not just a matter of good preaching or whatever. It's it's a matter of the people as a nation saying we're Christian and that's how it's going to be. And so, and in that you kind of encourage people to have 
you know, good Christian behavior. So you think like, yeah. May, like Mayberry, uh, you know, you think uh, Mayberry and the, uh, the Andy Griffith show and all, all these people are very friendly and nice and decent, but behind that, what, what made that possible was pretty significant social expectations of behavior. Yeah. That no, you, and, and training kids to say, no, this is polite. This is proper as we ought to do. So there is force and we, but we tend to think, oh, that's bad. That there's thing that there's bad aspect that, or that, that it's bad that we have these social forces that, that lead people to, to act a certain way. But I think it's actually yeah. really good. And so right. we, we can learn something from these people who are pushing degeneracy uh, yeah. that fundamentally they're using, I think, a force that God has given society but they're using it for corrupt ends. And we as Christians right. should say, no, well, we ought to have that kind of force too. The ideal arrangement would be something like Mayberry, where it's kind of subtle. Uh, it mm-hmm. kind of relies on some, some uh, glances that, that are dis, you know, disapproving glances at times right. and maybe more. Like, but it, it works, that here. and it was good. Yeah. And I, I'd rather live in Mayberry than in you know Portland or, <laughs> or San Francisco. Right. And, and so, uh, yeah, and that's, it's because that there were these strong but subtle, but very good yeah. social expectations. In a, in a Christian city, it's not all, let's, let's call the police and have them go arrest that woman because her shorts are two inches too short. It's, there are yeah. other social forces that need to be taken hold of, like the glance, the disapproving glance yeah. from the grandmotherly, you know, walking down. Like, and you left the house <laughs> looking like that. Like, and you thought this was a good idea. We don't. We don't do that here, you know, or I mean, did, you, you, know, did you see that video of there was like an, an Italian nun who was. Oh, yes. Was like breaking up the, the lesbians. Yeah. We, like that's the kind of thing where she's just. That's what we need. Just astonished and, and, and like physically. No, no, no. So. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, what? What are you doing? You can't do that here. Get out of here. You yeah. need a people that will. You know, we, we've talked about it in terms of even, you know, it, let's say that in. In Ogden, here where the, our church is, we, there's no abortion clinic in, in Ogden. If we want to go evangelize at an abortion clinic, we have to drive 45 minutes to Salt Lake City. And, and we've sort of imagined as a thought experiment, well, what if in in 30 years we had continued to have children and disciple them and raise them and grow them, and people were starting businesses and getting more and more vested ownership interest in this city so that we we were very rooted and we had some kind of sway and a lot of businesses on 25th Street, our, our historic street, were owned by people in the Christian community. And then they tried to open an abortion clinic. You know, and it's not just the case that we we would want to work through other means like the zoning or, you know, different civil power. But there's also the aspect of if you just said, if there was a people that said, we don't, we won't permit this here. Just the people said, no, we're not going to permit yeah. this. Like there are lines that that we won't cross. That's the kind of social force that I think one of the errors plaguing our political thinking in the American uh, current day really is this kind of yeah. I I just we want to be left alone. We we don't really care what's happening. You know, you can dress immodestly, you can be gay, you can do whatever you want to do. We just sort of want to be left alone and not understanding properly just this law of the universe that sin leavens everything. That if you permit sins to just work their way through the people, it's not that you're just going to be able to be left alone and and kind of sit over in your box of your Christian world, because those people are going to be shaping the, 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 the people and the civil and the society that you live in, they're they're going to be shaping the expectations, the norms, the standards for what is good, true, and beautiful. They're going to be shaping those things. You you have to play, like you have to have offense. You can't just have defense. You know, I don't I don't know what your assessment would be of the pro. Like, what is our problem if you were going to rant from your front? Well, my mic's cutting out. If you were to rant from your front porch and say like the kids these days, it, where would you locate? The, the 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 problem you know if you're saying these are some of the biggest problems that you see in our and I'm talking about the Christian culture and the Christian world maybe broadly but also as it comes to the discourse on things like Christian political theory Christian nationalism politics where are we going wrong 
you know, what do you think we should do about it? <laughs> where are we going wrong? Where are we going well, wrong? Where do I Kids begin on days? that? Um, <laughs> yeah, I actually see it's hard. It's hard to, to it's hard to assess the Christian world because all you see is your followers on followers on Twitter, or some friends you have on Facebook or something. I, I see some encouraging signs that I think the more people get into the the older works of, of political of political theology and theology, I think the the more they'll they'll see how far we've come. I, I think a lot of people, some people doing kind of this resourcement, I don't think that they have a modern disposition modern Christian disposition, even though they like intellectually what they're reading. Mm. But I think if we I think so I think that's one of the things I think that the overemphasis on on this idea of witness and that witness that the church's witness has to be the sort of weak if Christendom comes around again, it'll be because of the witness of the church instead of actual political strategy or political that, examples. The yeah, that's just a, a, guy. something I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just tweeted tweeted about that before we came on here. Yeah, he uh, and, was saying something about. He said, yeah. uh, "I have no problem with Christendom as a normative concept, but there's a crucial difference between attempting to bring it about as some sort of political strategy, and rejoicing in its emergence as a fruit of the church's witness." Yeah, which is historically. That, I mean, it's well. Uh, the the my issue with that. I mean, I I think there's well, there's there's conceptual issues and issues of principle there and and coherence, yeah. but I think it represents a this disposition we have that somehow the Christendom or the idea of a Christian na- Christian nationalism or some kind of Christian state, it happens almost just by purely divine providence apart from human action mm-hmm. or the, or the only human action involved is, is nothing but you or, you know, churches. It, it's nothing but a sort of evangelistic strategy instead of political. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I don't, I, that does, I don't think, I know that sounds, that would sound appealing to many today, but I think it's, it's incoherent and I won't get into why. Yeah. But I think it just represents a disposition that we we have to be politically weak, we have to impress non Christians, we have to get their approval. Uh, that there's a certain way that Christians have to do politics, and uh, just co- it just just happens to coincide with being completely ineffective and uh, not achieving anything. <laughs> yeah, and so it's I think that's the disposition. So I think we should look at someone like you know Zing- Zwingli who died in battle defending his uh, his city. Essentially, defending what is, is understand that the, the church, yeah, he was out there front lines and ministering people, then jumped on his horse and he and he died in battle. So, I, I think that sort of disposition uh, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean we have to shout loud on Twitter and there's strategies involved here. Uh, but I do think it requires more. We have to have a disposition of we can actually order ourselves, and we can eliminate the pornographers, we can eliminate the yeah. the sexual deviants. Uh, we can we can um, we can eliminate some of the, the excesses of kind of our market society. Uh, we can we can do all sorts of things here, and we ought to do it, and we ought to do it with strength and resolve. People bring out all sorts of strategies to to destroy that idea, but I'm I'm hope I'm hopeful that that will return. Yeah, that there is this assertive will for for this sort of action. Yeah, it, one of the things that seems to I mean this this cycle that you see where the Good men create good times, and ultimately, hard yeah, times create yeah. good men again. You know, you, you see this. I, I think more and more Christians have woken up through various apocalypses. These revealing, revealings, unveilings, like the, the COVID situation, where you have literally, I mean, thousands and thousands and millions of normie Christians who were probably much more on the perspective politically of like, let's just be nice. Let's not make waves. Like, let's let the, you know, what's going to happen if the gays get married? It's no big deal. To like, oh, no, they're actually intending to fully conquer the political institution and then us. They hate everything about us. And they're not content to let us be. They actually want to see us completely go away. They want to see Christian morality literally criminalized in many cases. And so I think a lot of Christians are waking up to this just the impotency of this kind of like the the political strategy of having no political strategy other than the church's witness where it's just it seems to be 
like we've we've said before on the King's Hall podcast that Christians today, a lot of them seem to have they've took the spiritual gift assessment and they found out that their spiritual gift was getting conquered by pagans. So, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like that was that was what it's 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 right between acts of mercy and administration. It's getting conquered by pagans. And I think a lot of it just comes back to this, uh, or, or my hope is that Christians will, and, and I mean just normal Christians, normal Christians who maybe even have no idea what the word resourcement means, are just going, they're realizing the play that's being run on them, and they, they, they realize that it is going to take them, uh, Christians, organizing, coalescing, and saying, no, but because we love our neighbor, we actually want them to be ruled with actual justice and not yeah. with arbitrary, not not in accordance with the arbitrary whims and statement of faith of demons. <laughs> because there, because there doesn't yeah. seem to be all real really other options over the long time horizon. You, it seems like you either end up being ruled by demons or. By Christians, I, I I just over the long haul, I don't see it, many other historical examples. To the yeah, contrary, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the problems with conservatism uh, is that they, yeah, like you said, it's they, it's this just leave me alone sort of mentality. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and we thought for decades, just okay, just fine, <laughs> go do that thing, whatever you're doing. Yeah, and just but leave leave us alone, uh, and that was very yeah. foolish. Yeah. And yeah. that sort of that's that that idea is being now ex- it reapplied. So someone like David French and and the others who want to and Paul Miller who want to support uh, like drag queen things as blessings of liberty. That's just now reapplied. Well, we can let mm-hmm. you do that, but we just just leave us alone. You know, yeah. religious liberty constitution. So they they say that that's how they do it. Just reapplied over and over and over. But it's really foolish because like, like you mm-hmm. said. We we had this like Aaron Rin would say like they had this neutral world mentality that now we're in the negative mm-hmm. world but people can't in order to cope with it they just yeah. reassert neutral world thinking, which set us up for to be really poor in the poor, in the negative world. That we need to get over that notion. The second thing is, we need to remember that civil power uh, is a power of God. It is it is yes. a power ordained of God, and is ordained of God for our good. Yes. I think it's I think be, I think it's firstly ordained for the good of Christians because we are the people of God. You know, mm-hmm. originally power uh, civil power was ordained for the good of God's people. Again, I think civil government's natural. So this is this yeah. ass- follows from that assumption. It was it was originally ordained for the good of God's people and now it's still ordained for the good of God's people who are Christians. Yeah. That's yeah. not to say that that it can't be also possessed and used for the good of non-Christians, but it's firstly used for the good of Christians. And uh, so we should, if that's true, which I think it is, then we should not be afraid to hand power to someone who's going to do good for the, for Christians. Um, Right. And, and I know that makes people uncomfortable. So I'll say this, that also means uh, what's good for Christians is generally is is going to be good for non-Christians as well. But I, you know, I say that just to satisfy people's, universalizing mentality where, you know, you always yeah. have to have, well, what about the non-Christians? You have to do it for them as well. But, but I'm saying, yeah, we're firstly in, for Christians, but of course that'll help non-Christians. It's not a zero um, sum. Yeah, right. It's right. not a yeah, zero exactly. sum. Thank well, you. if something's good for the Christians, it must be terrible for everybody. Like, it's that's not how the yeah. world works. It will be bad for some non-Christians. You know, I mean... Well, they, I mean, it will be, well they'll it, think it's bad it, because you're living in a place that they, they disapprove of. Exactly. Um, and, they, they won't be able to do things that certain things that they believe will fulfill and satisfy and be for their good. But the Christian, even then, if he's doing it right, should actually be able to say, you think that you that what you want is good, but what you want will actually lead to your... And honestly, your destruction. Homosexuality is such a good example of an activity that is so universally destructive to a human being and to a culture pornography is another really good example. So it's something that is so universally destructive to a to a to an individual, a family, a society, like whatever level you want to zoom in or out on. It's just so obvious that if you say we want people to have the liberty 
to make hardcore pornography and distribute it freely for monetary gain, that you've just done something that they might think is for their good. And they might say, you're hindering me from doing something I want to do, which is my good. Well, we're actually forcibly protecting you from one of the most destructive things you could do with your with your time yeah. and your energy. You don't have to convince them of that either. <laughs> so it's, um, mm-hmm. I mean, you might have to practically, but uh, but in principle, sure. you don't. Uh, it's you don't have a yeah. uh, magistrate is not bound to permit injustice just because he can't convince people that it's unjust. He couldn't persuade him. Uh, he he yeah. has the he has authority by the assent of the governed, but that doesn't mean every yeah. law he enacts has to be some like some, you know democratically affirmed. Yeah. So consent raises interesting questions too of whether mm. non Christians in a Christian state th- their consent matters at all. But uh, Ooh, but yeah, but, but <laughs> that's another interesting <laughs> question. But yeah, I'm, again, it's a power ordained of God. It's yeah, ordained yeah. for our good. It's not ordained to keep things neutral. I mean, right. maybe in, in of course in some cases uh, a, a magistrate might have to permit some vice just because the <clears throat> enforcement of it actually does more harm than good. Yeah, that is the correction of the vice does more harm than good. Yeah, um, because and or it's best left to the family, or it's best left to the church. Right. Um, but still, the it, it's if he can actually correct it and and reduce the harm, then then he ought to. Yeah. Uh, or or he or they, if it's a kind of an assembly. The big point there is that we should think instead of thinking, we should distinguish between the government in itself and the government as it has existed often. So we might say our governments today are unjust or tyrannical, whatever you want to say they are, that they're bad in this and that way. But that doesn't mean that the gov- government in itself, that doesn't mean that the power that the power um, used for bad, for evil, uh, it, which you could say is, you know, they're not using the power rightly, um, but the yeah. power in itself is good. Just like government itself is good. The, the office of magistrate is in itself good. Um, regardless of how how those are applied in, uh, in good or evil ways, mm. so in that sense, we should we should look at these 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 institutions and offices as a force for good and, and yeah. from God. And you know, uh, I think as Americans and influenced by some dispensationalists, maybe Baptists, some Baptist backgrounds, mm-hmm. not all Baptists, but uh, will tend to have a very negative view of government. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I, I think we should get over that yeah, and, and see at least the state governments as more forceful in their use of power. Yeah. Well, last question. I know we're at, we're, we're running out of time here and I'll, I'll frame this one because we, we have, I think I, I don't, I haven't done a survey, so I don't know, but I suspect that most of the King's Hall audience probably is somewhere in would if they you were to say describe your political theology, describe your your view of the law, describe your view of these things, they would say, well, I'm Kyperian, sphere sovereignty, theonomic, uh, on of some degree. And if you started asking the listener, what do you mean by that? Some of them would say, well, bo- everything Bonson ever said. Some of them might mean something softer, well, gener- more general equity kind of stuff. What what would you want to say to a th- an audience of theonomists, what would you want them to, you know, what, what's your assessment, I guess, of the theonomic movement? And then what would you want the the, the theonomic camp maybe to be reading or to be looking into? And this is a spicy question. I'm not necessarily, you know, yeah. you won't offend well, us, I, right? I would like, direct <laughs> them to my, I wrote an um, an article for the Lyceum Institute. What is it? Uh-huh. Uh, well, the title the of the London, article is, yeah, the London Lyceum. Yeah, something like I'll that. try to have a link to that in the description. Yeah, if you could, thanks. Uh, it's the title of it is Reformed Theonomy. I don't know. I forget what I said. What the title is now? Yeah. Anyway, you'll see it. Um, that outlines what I th- that what I think is a, a more classically Protestant theonomic view. So I, I wouldn't be theonomist as most people understood the sure. understanding theonomy. Uh, it's my view. Of theonomy is it's rooted somewhat in, in uh, Franciscus Junius's mosaic polity, which I think is a really good book. Okay. Uh, it's, it's recently been translated a few years ago. So mosaic polity by Franciscus Junius. I think that's excellent. Ooh. And well, I don't want to get into all my critiques, but th- this is one thing that, that I, and, and perhaps you, you could correct me, but if, if you don't think this is true. 
My concern with theonomy is it doesn't, as it's often articulated, is it, it, uh, its ethics do not uh, assume that whatever is good is actually inherently good for the person, but it's good simply because it's declared good by God. Uh, and it, it doesn't cohere. It's not that the, the theonomic ethics, the set of ethics, is doesn't cohere naturally. It's not fundamentally suitable or fitting for man as man as who he is. But it's more of do these things because God says you do these things, and they're good because He says they're good. Now you might say that that's wrong, but one of the reasons why I'm drawn to natural law is that when I say or anyone says this is good, it's a question of is something suitable for who you are, what you are, what God created, so that there's a correspondence between humans, man as man, and the duty of man. Mm. In the sense that that if you were a complete, perfect human, you would be drawn to that perfectly because of simply who you are. And that, that means that all law, like civil law, has to be rooted in, in natural law. And a true, like a, a just civil law is, is a law that that is good for man as he is a man, not simply because it's something commanded by, mm. by God. I, I hope that makes some sense. Maybe that's not a good critique, but I, I will say that if you read my article, it, I, I do try to say there is something theonomic in that, in that natural law is a law of God. It's the yeah. law of God for man. And so any just application of that via the civil magistrate into civil law is is just law. And in fact, it's a command of God. So it's theonomic because the the civil magistrate is the mediator of divine civil rule and can enact law Mm -hmm. based upon that prior law um, for um, that. So that you act in a sense to obey civil law that's justly derived from natural law is to obey God, even though in a sense it originated as civil law from the, the magistrate. Um, Interesting. So that that's kind of my yeah. uh, my my view. So that I know people don't want to say that's theonomic, but I think if we're talking about the law of God, uh, we can call mm-hmm. civil law law of God, even if it's instituted by a human, when that law is derived from the natural law, which is God's law. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, more, well, I'm more more formally God's law. Yeah. I ask that just out of sheer curiosity, to be honest. <laughs> and and so, listeners, give us your thoughts. Uh, you can yeah. you can even if you want if you want to argue with Doctor Wolf <laughs> you can head to at Perfinjust P E R F I N J U S D I'll put a link in the description and I'll give you a link to that article as well um, that's a question I've I've been interested to ask people who I mean I think clearly are seeing similar issues giving similar um, remedies to those issues but but don't self-describe as, well, I'm theonomic, I'm in this camp, I'm in that camp. Because I, I do think there's quite a bit of overlap when you get into the, one of my one of my theories is that classical, like two kingdoms, uh, classical Reformed and Protestant thinking on these things is actually pretty similar in a lot of ways to a lot of how um, Kuyperian sphere sovereignty and theonomists end up landing the plane in issues. And I think there's a lot of overlap there. I would even say I think sphere sovereignty and that Kuyperian concept is compatible. It's fairly compatible with classical two kingdoms language, provided you're defining your terms carefully. And maybe there's differences and distinctions that are important. Um, But I think it's a conversation that's worth having. So thank you so much for coming on the King's Hall. We didn't even talk about two kingdoms. You've... uh... We didn't. Hey, if you if you've got five minutes, I'll ask you. <laughs> okay, fine. I, I will. What do you think about I, I love, two I love kingdoms? The subject. Yes. What do you think about two kingdoms theology <laughs> historically and today? That is a. I completely forgot I, I was supposed to ask. I could talk about this yes. for three hours. Um, well, let's just do it. Three hours. Forget. Uh, uh, for, no. <laughs> clear the schedule. <laughs> no, I, but I, I mean, yeah, I want to bring this up. Is that yeah. I think there's a lot of confusion on it. The confusion is often by people who call themselves two kingdoms. <laughs> um, the, the the modern version that's pushed by someone like Mike, uh, Michael Horton Van Drew yep. and, and I, I think I think they've been just critiqued so thoroughly that, but it it's not the it's not the historic view, um, and getting in exactly what two kingdoms theology is, is could be would be take a long, long time. But I think the summary would be there's two kingdoms. One kingdom is a spiritual one is kind of the natural or the common. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's called common kingdom. 
was something called redemptive kingdom. The other one called, uh, I don't know what the opposite of redemptive would be, <laughs> um, but the non-redemptive kingdom. Enslaved um, kingdom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Just kidding. So I uh, usually the, the spiritual kingdom is associated in some way with the instituted church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you can have disagreements between Presbyterians and Anglicans on the precise how you'd understand that. Uh, and the things of that kingdom would be, you know, like the sacred things like the preaching and the office of the pastor and the, uh, the and sacraments. And those things serve people in the, in that kingdom as in, mm-hmm. and usually in the form of the people think of it in the form. It's essentially in the conscience you exist. It's like a invisible eschatological sort of kingdom to be realized or like yet to be revealed. And it's composed mm-hmm. of only the elect. So people who are in the church, Outwardly, but not in the church. Inwardly, or not in, they're not in the actual spiritual kingdom. Whereas the the opposite, the the, the common kingdom, uh, something called the natural kingdom, that's the kingdom of kind of this world, you could say, uh, in, in a in a sense, and that's the kingdom of magistrates and people who exist in their earthly life. And the the difference, the the, the important difference here, I and mean, we only have a few more minutes. The, the only the important difference is that. Within the earthly kingdom, you maintain the traditional hierarchies of, of husband and wife, you know, traditionally be master and slave or master servant. Mm-hmm. Um, you maintain the, the magistrates have still continue to have authority. Um, whereas in the spiritual kingdom, everyone is, either, you can say they're either equal. Like before in Christ, there's no man or woman. There's no mm-hmm. Jew or Greek, um, no master slave. They're all kind of one in Christ, equal in Christ. Uh, and you could say there's there, there's probably inequality in heaven, but it's not according to the it's not like the, the first in the kingdom of, kingdom of God could be a woman, you know. But whereas, uh, or it could be a slave. Like the most godly person could be a slave, and that person's first, you know. So yeah. But yeah. that doesn't mean that in the common or the natural kingdom that it disrupts those hierarchies. So mm-hmm. the reason you keep the two separate is you can affirm that some people are uh, that that the that there's an order in this life that ought to be maintained. Yeah. And the the fact that this in this other kingdom, this other kind of forum, uh, this other, I don't know, let's just say kingdom, uh, has people who are equal or ordered differently, mm-hmm. um, by which I mean spiritually. I don't mean like pastor and I don't mean that. The, the, the one doesn't in, invade or, or destroy the other. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I mean, yeah, you can say the, the, the common kingdom is also called temporal kingdom because there will be no magistrates in heaven. Um, it seems that there'll be no marriage or husband wife relationship in heaven and there'll be no child bear in heaven so there'll be a sort of temporal these temporal institutions will be uh kind of eliminated and and then the they're temporal whereas the eternal kingdom will are is of course eternal so that's kind of the mm-hmm. distinction i, I think yeah. it's very important because it it allows you and calvin said this explicitly it allows you to separate these these two things so that and you see like new Cal, neo calvin is often kind of Blur the blur the distinctions, so they t- kind of think of the, this immanentizing way where they b- won't bring heaven to earth and like kind of like re, uh, uh, redeem earthly life into heavenly life almost, and that's I think again they're they're collapsing the two kingdoms, um, and in doing so it, you have to wonder by what principle they still for marriage and childbirth because if there's no marriage in heaven then why. Um, why is there, what, why would you continue marriage in, in earthly life? So mm-hmm. I think if you maintain the two, the, the, the distinction, um, and then the problem with the R2K side, like th- that is like the, yeah the, the modern two kingdom approach is they want to separate those two. Um, sometimes they, they locate too much of the spiritual kingdom in the church itself, the instituted church. Uh, I don't think that's their great, greatest problem. I think the biggest problem is that they they fail to see that this earthly life or the common natural temporal kingdom ought to be ordered to the eternal, um, invisible, uh, you know, heavenly kingdom. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, it is like so families and, and nations should be oriented and support the work of ministry and heavenly life, that sort of thing. So anyway, I, that's that's a very brief. Yeah. We can get into more of it. I hope that was clear enough. <laughs> Probably not. Um, we actually did a podcast on uh, on two kingdoms theology couple of times. I think we did two episodes. Yeah. So on Ars Politica. So you can check that out if you guys want to, if you're still with us after an hour. And <laughs> you know, minutes. I always think they'll, they'll jump off, but they, we keep doing long episodes and people keep listening. So okay, good, good. listeners, thank you for, for uh, hanging in there. And um, maybe one last question on that. Is there a 
can you think of a, wor- a work or a book or a, you know, some authors even that you would say for what you, you would say is that this is the correct view of the two kingdoms? Mm. Where, where should someone I, start? I know- well, I, my view comes from uh, unpublished works of Samuel Rutherford, uh, which I think One, I think perfect. Uh, well, they were published, but it was you know sixteen yeah. hundreds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think his he has a book on church government that that um, that goes after Erastus mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. Erastus and Hooker, yeah. Richard Hooker. Yeah, uh, it's I forget the whole title, but yeah, you know, I mean that you find that online. I, I but I, for the Anglican side of things, which you know uh, he purports to be the most common view, I don't agree, but. Uh, Brad Littlejohn has a little a little guidebook mm-hmm. on two. I think it's like Two Kingdoms Guide for the Perplexed, and mm-hmm. it's a short book. You may not agree with everything in it, yeah, but it's still a good presentation of Two Kingdom Two Kingdom theology of a more historic perspective that you'd probably see in in England mm-hmm. among kind of the Church of England, yeah, um, and uh, and so I think that would be worth checking out for that version. Yeah. I, I mean, again, I don't, I don't, I don't hundred percent agree with it, but I think it's a good, sure. good kind of classical Protestant. Yeah. account of it. Yeah. One, one of the things I think is very important for Christians who take seriously this applicational, all of Christ for all of life sort of living where they, they want to order their lives in accordance to God's will for every area of their life and see weaknesses in the modern church in the way the modern church thinks about culture, politics, uh, all of these things, it's it's so important that we actually stop and take the time to go and, and understand how has the church thought about this? How, what categories did they think in? And even if you end up not coming to identical convictions as Dr. Wolf or, you know, anybody else, it's it's important that we knowledgeably interact with these ideas and even as you talk, I still I think that there's there's a sense in which modern maybe not modern, but a lot of the the thinking under the headings of sphere sovereignty and in Kyperian sphere sovereignty, to me comes across almost as a species of classical two kingdoms thinking, or at least that it's trying to do the yeah, same yeah. thing to give conceptual categories that you can overlay over scripture in the world. And understand and, and sort of put things in the right buckets and understand how where does this part of life fit and what does God command for it? You know, what is yeah, God's I, will I, for this I part think, of life? Yeah, I mean, my, my critique of, of of neo-Calvinist political theology is not in sphere sovereignty. I think that's mm-hmm. just yeah, that, that, that's just like that, that's not even distinctively neo-Calvinist. I mean, the right. idea that you have these separate entities in society and each has its own responsibilities, but there's overlapping and, and mm-hmm. they mutually support each other. I mean, that's just basic political thought, but yeah. So I, I think there is overlap. I think just the, my, my, again, my, my concern, my, my disagreement like Neo Calvinism would be that they, 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 they collapse heaven and earth. Uh, they collapse the two kingdoms. They reject these, what they call dualisms, which I think are necessary um, for Protestant theology and political thought. So um, but yeah, I mean, I, in terms of sphere sovereignty, I think there's a lot of overlap. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm I mean, really just look- to hear a, a theonomist account of sphere sovereignty. Yeah, I would. I would love to hear. And even you know, let's let's start it. Let's start a Twitter war right now. As you're listening, <laughs> listeners, just start. The, not I'm, the thing with theonomists <laughs> though is that because like, I'm pretty. Uh, I mean, there, there's some things I, I'll be very like openly critical of something, but mm-hmm. theonomists sometimes are they can get really. Um, I don't know. They they can they can go after you pretty harshly. They have so, been so known don't, to don't carry do that a big to me, stick. Guys. No, come I'm on. just come on. Yeah, I'm, don't, I'm no. trying to be irenic with all, all yeah. the theonomists. I will say one of the reasons no canceling why, our guests. No yeah, canceling our guests. One of the reasons why <laughs> I yeah say something positively at, on the end. I know we're running we're past time or overtime, <laughs> but the thing with theonomists I like is is that they I think that they're they have a good disposition. I think they we're right about the trajectory of Western society. Mm. And even though I don't agree with some of the things I, I, I see them as allies. And mm. that's part of the reason why I wrote that article to say, look, I'm not, on yeah. your, I'm, I'm, I don't agree with you, but I, I get, I get where you're coming from. Here's just my way of talking, thinking theonomically. Yeah. But I, but I think, I think theonomists can, uh, can be allies with, 
with people who have a classical two king approach yes. that have a disposition to kind of have a, an assertive will uh, in politics and see some sort of Christian establishment of some form. Yeah, um, can and should society. can and should get along. And uh, the friend enemy distinction, I think we need to get get that category into the friend <laughs> camp. Yeah, where definitely. Yes, we recognize yes. we're aiming for 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 similar aims and in in some places identical aims and uh need to to get that friend enemy distinction right one of the one of the we've actually talked about this on the show before one of the issues that anybody who is in the theonomic camp has to recognize is that uh theonomic the theonomic world has been one of the most highly schismatic worlds in existence Mm -hmm. i mean within 10 years of the origins of self-consciously describing a movement as theonomic there were like four different theonomies and camps and Tyler Texas and different different groups that were you know at odds with each other and one of the reasons is I, th- I think because whenever you have a people who are they're combative they, they're seeing problems and they're aggressively uh, and often rightly aggressively attacking and saying no we need to do this differently we're going to be conquered if we don't you know we're going to continue to be conquered it can the friend enemy distinction can get blurred along minor disagreements that actually then ends up making your your project at large in peril. And and that's what I you know, it, it the project of season one of the King's Hall is the new Christendom. It's like that's what we're talking about. And you're you're not gonna have the new Christendom, whether whether anybody listening thinks it's gonna happen or not, it won't happen uh without getting the friend enemy distinction right across in in house disagreements. Yeah, and in and, terms of friends, yeah. I don't want to say that these people are it that that um yeah i mean well, let me just say in terms of friends the we should think of certain baptists as friends mm-hmm. presbyterians some anglicans mm-hmm. and uh and 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 theonomists because i think we if we if we share a certain i keep using the word disposition but if we if mm-hmm. I mean, we all know that there, there, there's some Baptists out there. There's the guy named William Wolf. He's a kind of a recent Twitter guy, but he's getting a following. All yeah. I hate. He, he's a Baptist, but I, I think he yeah. and I could stand side by side and fight the fight. You know? Oh, likewise, so yeah. The same thing I think with the- Theonomists as well. We need to stop thinking that we need to stop being purists theologically, and mm-hmm. uh, and and if if we can all affirm each other's mutual Christianity and faith. Yeah. Um, despite our theological differences, and we can be allies. And yeah. in the American tradition, that doesn't mean we're going to be drowning Baptists. All right. No, that's just not right. going to happen. We don't, we don't do that. Um, I mean, we did, okay, 200 years. <laughs> we, I mean, we don't do that. Not, I mean, well, we did, but we don't yeah, anymore. We, we're not, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, well, okay. We it's a long drown. time ago. We, yeah. we, we whipped them. Um, but that's a different <laughs> story. I, mean, I did my dissertation on this. So, um, oh, that's, it's, oh, uh, yeah. I, I think I understand a little better than, oh, well, you just, you just whipped them. They right. showed up and they got off the boat and you whipped them. No, uh, <laughs> but there are people who are theologically in our camp, like people who would yeah. affirm two kingdoms theology who they're really not, I don't want to say they're enemies, <laughs> but they're not exactly right. friends. They're not allies. So yeah, we should not align based upon these finer theological distinctions or the, 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 theology right. camps, but this sort of this like common, yeah, a sort of will, I think. Well, um, William Wolf's a great example because I mean, yeah. he, he definitely a guy. I I really I like following. I'm people. You should follow him if you're not already. Says a lot of interesting stuff. Makes makes a lot of enemies that are the right enemies, if that makes sense. Right. right. And and he's so Baptist. I mean, he's he says some the other day. I was I was like, come on. I mean, like we shouldn't the Mark Deverite kind of. We shouldn't be baptizing anybody until they're you know, I don't know, 35 and have their mortgage oh, paid yeah, off. I hate that, yeah. He didn't say that, actually, guy. That was uncharitable. <laughs> but, you know, the the uh, basically only adults should be baptized, and that that is that is a very representative view in a lot of Reformed Baptists or particular Baptist streams. So, to be fair, that's what they, that's, that's what they think. And I'm t- abs- I could not be further from that, from that view. And yet, William Wolfe was on my team. Absolutely. Like, he's on my team. Could could yeah, could stand it, yeah. side by side and fight a lot of the same battles in the same ways, aiming for the same thing. So, yep. anyway, well, thank you so much again. I'm so glad you reminded me about that question that I said before we recorded. I was going to ask you because that is really interesting to think about, and I think uh, something that we we all need to figure out 
in terms of relating to one another across these distinctions and differences and even slightly different tribal lines if we are to be effective in the long haul. Um, So thanks again for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time. And again, if you guys haven't already, make sure you go follow Dr. Wolf on Twitter and uh, check out the Ars Politica podcast. Read that article on the London Lyceum. We'll have a link there in the description. Uh, and I believe it's called Classical Reformed Theonomy. So Here it is, yeah. w- uh, really appreciate your time and hope we can talk again sometime in the future. And looking forward to your book as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. This is fun. Well, everybody, uh, thanks for listening in on this episode of the King's Hall. Thanks again to Dr. Wolf for joining us on this episode. As always, we do want to thank our patrons over at patreon.com slash the king's hall who have helped make this show possible uh as a show of our thanks we do release a special patron exclusive podcast every single week along with the main episode uh called after hours and so this week there's another installment of that up there patrons you can check that out and join us there uh, to help support the show and also when you sign up we'll send you a sweet mug as our thank you. We also want to thank Christendom Bible College uh, and Reformation Heritage Books, our sponsors for this episode. We hope that you'll check out uh, their stuff and uh, support them as well as a way of supporting the show. And again, thanks for listening, guys. Make sure that you remember Festa Nalente, make haste slowly. These are long haul projects that we're talking about, not just for Christendom, but also for your own families, for your own life. And uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you as you continue this long plod in obedience to his will.